Hi, everyone. My name is PK, and here I have Glenn James here from My Millennial Money. Most of you probably know him, but this is going to be hopefully like a really interesting and really cool episode, something that I haven't really done before. We're going to go into not just property, but just how people can get ahead, even if they only have $5,000, $10,000, maybe $15,000, how to multiply that and how to think about finances. That is really the, the speciality of Glenn. So I'm super grateful. Just before I do the, the formal introduction, everything, I'm super grateful, Jen, Glenn, um, for you making the time. Thanks, PK. And it's uh, it's going to be great to have a chat with uh, you and your audience. So hello, everyone. <laughs> I, I just want to introduce you um, real quick, even though I think most people will know you. Um, Glenn is a former financial advisor. He's also an author. He's put out many books, I think, like Sort Your Money Out, Get Invested, and most recently, Sort Your Career Out, which we might talk about a little bit later as well. And I think, you know, the the thing that most people probably know you um, about is My Millennial Money Podcast. It's a podcast that I listen to. I don't know how many views or how many listens it gets, but it's probably in the multiple hundreds of thousands every single month. So Glenn's kind of a big deal. <laughs> um, and we're very grateful to, to have him on. But I think the, the coolest thing about it all is that, you know, he's not like like me, some like investment banker trying to share his story. He's he's actually just a normal person. He was a tradesperson. He migrated into the field, so to speak, of finance. So he can speak the language of the everyday person. He tries to do so in a way that's like consumable, digestible, and just fun. Okay. So I hope that this episode will be, you know, really palatable for everyone um, that listening. And yeah, just super grateful to have you on again, Jen. Welcome to the Oz Property Investment Mastery Podcast. My name's PK and I help busy people build passive income by buying top 5% growth and cash flow property and build a portfolio using data without wasting months doing research, spending weekends at inspection or catching flights, or dropping ten to twenty thousand dollars on buyers agents every single time. So if you're confused, lack confidence, and just overwhelmed with all the information and marketing misinformation available online and don't know where to start, then this show is for you. Well, there's so much I wanted to um, kind of get through, um, but maybe we can just start like from the start, which is like, how did you get into to finance? Yeah, I think it was more of a, oh, I was always interested in personal finance as a young person, as a teenager. Like I read all the personal finance books and just was really interested. And I remember maybe when I was 15, one day I got my parents to drop me off at a community college day session about share investing and, you know, I'd rock up on a Saturday and there'll be all these retirees, you know, talking <laughs> about shares and there was a teacher and yeah, I, I've just always had an interest in personal finance. I don't know where it's from, maybe got some suspicions, not sure, but yeah, I just was interested. And as you said, in your opening, I did a trade after I left school and always knew that I wanted to work with my mind and not my hands. And that's, you know, I did the trade and then I started studying financial planning and then went and got a, got a job at a financial planning firm, entry level baseline, get started and kind of moved my way up. I became a power planner and became an associate advisor. Um, and then I started my own business, my own financial planning business um, on the New South Wales Central Coast. I was commuting to Sydney before that and I knew I didn't want to continue to work in Sydney, which is an hour and a bit away from where I lived, kind of like Gold Coast to Brisbane vibes for, for you. And yeah, I uh, just thought, well, I'm 25, I'm qualified, I like what I do, I think I'm good at it. And I gave that a shake and for 10 years I ran my own financial planning business and then uh, effectively in 2002, 18, 19, sold that business and transitioned out and put all my chips on the podcast table, pushed them in. Um, and I'm still standing today. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't know those dates. So 
you finished up with that business in 2000, was it 18 or, or around there? Yeah, the end of 18, start of 19, I started the transition out of okay. my financial planning business. Yeah. Right. And you'd be doing it for 10 years. So if my math is correct, you started that business, was it like smack bang in the middle of the GFC or just after? Just after 2010, I started the business. Just after. Which well, was kind of cool that? because <laughs> I didn't have to have any hard, hard conversations with any clients for the 10 years that I had my business. And then, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. then COVID hit and the markets crapped themselves. So it was <laughs> awesome. I mean, sure, there was some minor little Is corrections. There's a sweet spot right in the middle there. Yeah. So I was really lucky in that regard. How, how did you get people, sorry, this is like a really rude question, no, I don't care. but like, how did you get people or clients to take you seriously as like a 25 year old, you know, with no experience and all of a sudden the world economy is just crumbled? Like how, how did you, how did you go about doing that? Yeah, it's a really good question. And actually there's a, a, a story that I've put in the actual career book that you mentioned at the start, sort your career out about being young and you know, wanting people to take you seriously and whatnot. Mm. So what I did was, you know, business 101, my first year of business, I focused on getting people to send me clients. So number one, I would speak with a heap of mortgage brokers, a heap of accountants, heap of lawyers, heap of bookkeepers, real estate agents, whatever. So they could send their clients to me. And part of the deal was, hey, if you send a client to me, I'll look after them. I won't screw them. I'll ring fence you. So if they go, oh, we need to review our mortgage, go back to your mortgage broker. So I really focused on uh, building centers of influence that would send me clients, number one. So they were already a warm lead. Uh, I never, ever cold called. I made the decision, you know, basically when I started my business that the day I have to pick up the phone and cold call... I'm giving up and I'm going to sell mobile phones at Westfield. Like I was never going to cold call. So that's number one. The leads were coming to me hot and warm. Yeah. So that was a big barrier. Then as a 25, 26 year old professional starting a business, I'd have, you know, pre-retirees come in and retirees. And I always remembered that look where they would book the appointment. They would come in. I was subletting an office. I'd get the call from Kathy and Kath would say, hey, so-and-so is here. I'm like, sweet, I'll come out and get them. Go out to the waiting room. They stand up, they see me in that look like, <laughs> who's this kid? <laughs> uh, but what you have to do, you have to realize, you've got to get out of your own head. You've got to realize that you are the professional in this situation. Those clients, regardless of their age, their life experience, they do not know a thing about financial planning. They don't know superannuation law. They don't know estate planning concepts. So number one, you are the professional. And by the end of the meeting, like they loved me. They really got value out of the meeting. And all that stuff, the start of the meeting was gone, that right. fear. Secondly, right. I actually had, a, uh, I had a, another business in the city uh, of Sydney. And I had a very wealthy 65-year-old lady ask me and I remember I was like 26 at the time she said and she basically called me out on that she goes well why should I take advice from you when you're obviously quite younger than me yeah. and I've got all this money and I said well that's a great question what I can say is number one you've had a few more years on the board at accruing money just basic age mm -hmm. but number two i said relatively speaking between me and all my friends and everyone that i know and even other financial advisors that i know i've probably got five to ten times more wealth than they have right and that kind of oh okay sweet so it wasn't about comparing to someone who isn't me like i'm well, someone I wasn't, which is a 65 year old who's worked all these years. I really think it was about having the confidence and you're not, you're not BSing and mm -hmm. remembering, get out of your head. You're the professional, look after them, be professional, be confident. And also there is that hygiene factor of it's hygiene that you need to know your stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what strikes me is 
that's like a really remarkable and confident answer that you gave. I mean, I don't know. It, it's not arrogant, um, but it's like really confident. And I that's just some great advice or, or great leading by example, because I know a lot of people who come to me in the property space and, you know, let's say they're 25, they're 30, they're maybe 35. They've got some properties, but they've hit their serviceability threshold. And, you know, let's be honest, ultimately the extent of your property portfolio is linked to your income. You know, that's mm. how banks lend you money. And so they're like, um, PK, I really want to start a business. Um, how did you do it? And I'm like, don't follow me. Like I did all sorts of wrong things. But they have this imposter syndrome where it's like, oh, I'm only 30, I'm only 25, I'm only 35. How can I charge other people who are more successful in other fields of life um, for something that I'm still kind of not fully sold on myself? But mm. um, it's it's really cool. I mean, that was ages ago. Well, not that long ago, but mm. more than 10 years ago when you did it at 25. Um, I know financial advisors working at CVA who are like, you know, 25 and they would have no confidence going on by themselves. So good on you. Yeah, um, thanks for doing and, that. And I think, you know, because I did leave school early at age 16 and did an apprenticeship, I really was probably more socially mature for my age anyway, mm. because being in the full-time workforce, dealing with adults every day, you know, 16, 17, 18. And, and that's why I think like, I didn't finish my apprenticeship sorry, I, I finished my apprenticeship. I didn't stay in that field. I don't even think that that was lost those years because I honestly still use skills that I used on the tools and it was a telecommunications apprenticeship. Um, so phone systems, PABX systems in offices and buildings and all that stuff that I still use today. And that's that practical thinking, the forward thinking and fault finding. Like we use a lot of tech here in the podcast and yeah. Yeah, nothing is ever wasted if you want to look back and learn from that and implement those things in your life. But yeah, it was just, I still remember when I said that to that lady that, oh, relatively speaking, you know, between everyone that I know who's around my age, I am more successful. It landed so well. And I was just thinking, God, that was a miracle that, you know, <laughs> I didn't like, what if I was like, oh, I got no answer for you, blah, blah, blah. And yeah, it's wild. And it's for those who are younger and professionals have a read of the story that's in the book because um yeah we do touch on that imposter syndrome and everyone's got it i still get it yeah. uh, but you've just got to push through it and get out of your own head that's all i can say on that yeah yeah uh, i still struggle with it to be honest um <laughs> that's, that's just the honest truth because if someone's listening to you and making whether it's tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of decisions you know you, you better know what you're doing and you know well, you have the duty of care yeah but i think if you if you're a bit of a go-getter and either you've like you pk you've got a bit of a platform and a profile you've got the youtube audience the podcast like if you don't have imposter syndrome from time to time because it, it kind of ebbs and flows and sometimes comes in mm. i'd say if you never get imposter syndrome you're probably a psychopath <laughs> because that's like imposter syndrome it is a natural feeling that normal people feel like i don't know if mm -hmm. i can do this i don't know if i'm confident or right. smart enough yeah if you're not having those basic human feelings you're a psychopath right good to know that i'm not a full psychopath thanks yeah, for just, that a little bit. Yeah, just a little bit yeah just a little bit so was it like so you went and, um, you know, presumably you gave up a very successful business and you went mm -hmm. kind of full time into the podcast side of things, my millennial money. So it's obviously my millennial money. You were dealing with 63 year old women, but were you also dealing as a financial advisor with, well, millennials or back then, you know, I don't know what they called them. Yeah. Um, is that how you were interested yeah, so in the millennial side of things? Yeah. So just in terms of my financial planning business and the world has changed, um, in financial planning land, you know, it's less, I was probably a bit of a generalist. I'd set my business up that the process and the back end, the systems and processes could handle a 22 year old client wanting some wealth advice, some investing advice, superannuation insurance, you know, cash flow and budgeting. Um, 
the business could handle and the processes could handle that, but it also could handle a, I had an 83 year old with, you know, I was managing, you know, multi-million dollars of, you know, her portfolio for her. Uh, and also my particular interest was small business uh, succession planning. Right. And, you know, key person strategies and estate planning for small business. So that was my kind of um, passion. Uh, so I did a bit of everything and it was, I think it was probably more so to keep me interested. Like one day I'm dealing with a pre-retiree client. The next day I'm talking with a small business who turns over $50 million a year. The next day I'm coaching a 28 year old out of debt. So yeah, a lot of businesses are steering away from that kind of um, yeah. everything model and niching down. And And there were some clients that if I said, oh, look, you know, if I got the call and I said, oh, we need financial advice for aged care um, for our parents, I'd be like, look, I'm not your guy for that. Like I still knew my limitations. While I could do it, mm -hmm. I wouldn't be confident and I'd probably fumble it. So, um, so yeah, I, I did get a variety of different clients and, yeah, that really made it interesting for me. And my kind of, for the business owners listening, my – ideal client had to meet a criteria of two things, right? The first criteria, they had to value my advice. Right. And the second criteria, they were willing to pay. Okay. <laughs> so it's the perfect thing. Like, so if, you know, if you, and I had clients in the early days that they were willing to pay, they didn't really value my advice. You know, I'll do formal recommendations. You need to do this, that, that. And they didn't do it. I'm like, well, what are we doing here? Like, yeah. this is a waste of everyone's time. So, yeah, value my advice and willing to pay. Right. right. Um, but, yeah, I, I effectively, you know, did that business. Um, I ended up really kind of not taking on new clients in the end because the, I was generating enough money. The money wasn't an issue and I was doing other industry things. I was on the board of the Association of Financial Advisors. So I, was, I had a really good industry leadership position, loved all that stuff. Um, and then I was kind of getting a bit bored. And at the time there wasn't really a general mainstream personal finance podcast uh, yeah. for Aussies by Aussies. Yeah. And that's why I called it um, my millennial money because at the time millennial was this big word and I'm like, Oh, what's something that rolls off the tongue? Millennial, my millennial, oh, my millennial money. Um, so yeah, I just basically did that and I'm always thinking of maybe a new name to rebrand it in the future. Um, I tried to trademark a name the other day just to have in the background, but they de declined it. So yeah, I'm, you know, and they'll, they'll always be millennials. They're just, yeah. you know, in 20 years, they'll be 55. Yeah. So, sure, sure. so yeah, I, um, it was just more of a bit of a marketing play to get onto that trend. And, you know, when I sold the business, I just took a big risk. So I had all this money in the, in the bank account. I'm like, I'm going all in on the podcast for the next 12 months. I'm doing podcasting, um, building an audience. And then after the 12 months, I thought I would review, come up for air. You know, if there was one listener every week, I'd still do an episode for 12 months. If there was a thousand still doing it. So consistency, trying it for 12 months, at least one episode a week. And yeah, at the end of the 12 months, I'm like, yep, I can double down on this. And I did. And I, I was looking at my journal the other day. And one of my goals when I started the business was to get $30,000 in sponsorship revenue okay. for the year, just $30,000 okay. a year. And I met that goal. And it's just crazy to think about, you know, now there's eight people in the team. So you don't have to do the maths much to know that I've got to do a lot more than $30,000 a year. In fact, yeah. I've got to do a lot more than $30,000 a month at the moment. Yeah, unless they're volunteers roll. or something, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I, I don't really do volunteers or interns because yeah. well, I think that's free labor and I'm not about that and that's another topic. But like, yeah, so you just got to start somewhere and back yourself. And my personality is if I see a gap in the market, I'll drive a truck through that gap and Amazing. see what happens. Yeah. Amazing. So, you know, like in the podcast, I mean, clearly it was um, – targeted at millennials in all your experience of all all of these episodes and you know you must have had a lot of engagement with your audience mm. and interaction like in the age bracket of 
25 to 35 or 20 to 40, whatever it is, what what were those millennials? What is the audience lacking or what is their pain point or what, they, what are they not sure about? Or maybe from your experience as a financial advisor, what mistakes are they making that you are able to plug that gap? You're able to drive that truck through. And I'm asking you this uh, from the context is obviously everyone watching this they're probably in those similar shoes. They may be making mistakes that they don't know about. They may have questions or, you know, like I remember when I was, um, I was going to say when I was little, but mm -hmm. um, that sounds like a bit preschooly. Uh, when I was much smaller, you know, I had no idea. And when you, when you think about trying to make money, like honestly, your head boggles. It's like, you know, you've got stocks, you've got property, you've got ETS, you've got index funds, you've got managed funds, you've got LICs, you've got commod, And these days you've got crypto, you've got a million things in the middle. It's just like really overwhelming. Mm -hmm. um, like what do you find millennials or your audience suffer or struggle with? And, and how have you been able to kind of plug that gap? Well, I think any content creator to start with, you've got to know your audience. You've got to know who you're talking to. And even before we press record, I asked you, I'm like, who am I talking to? Yeah. Because I need to know if I'm talking to a bunch of retirees who want to know about the next great annuity or how an annuity works, or am I talking to small business owners or am I talking to, you know, accumulators who love property and all that stuff. So I think knowing your audience and from early on, I've made it a point to really connect and know who I'm speaking with. And as a content creator, I would often have these, you know, existential crisis moments and I would think, crap, I've got to do this bloody podcast for the next five or 10 years. What the hell can I talk about? So number one, I've almost for my own emotional crutch or coping mechanism um, changed kind of in my mindset that I'm not the professional of all things. I'm a facilitator right. of a conversation and I'll right. give you my opinion. So I'm just facilitating conversation. Number two, I need to ask the audience what they want and use user generated content to make the content. So that's kind of, yeah, the, the fact that, you know, over the next five years, I've got to do 500 podcast episodes or more. It blows my mind. And I'm like, I can't think of that crap. So yeah, you know, we ask the audience and every year we do a census. This is a snapshot of the My Millennial Money listener. So 64% female, 36% male. Mm -hmm. The top five money goals of people who listen to My Millennial Money, share investing, increasing income, buying an investment property, travel, and number five, setting up life and income insurance. The median age of our listener is 29 years old. The median income is $102,000 and we've just got a bit of data. Uh, median net worth is 250 k median household income. Oh no, sorry. 32% of our listeners or 33% have a 200 k plus household income. <laughs> the wild thing is 75% have zero consumer debt. Um, and most people have some type of shares, you know, 15% do not have shares. Um, and you can see there probably a bit of a balance. You know, most people have healthy super funds. So every time I pick up a microphone, I'm effectively on balance talking to a 29 year old female who's earning a hundred grand a year, who's interested in shares, increasing income, investing property, bit of travel, and maybe setting up some life and income insurance. The interesting thing about the setting up life and income insurance for the top money goals of the last 12 months or so is we had a show sponsor um, who were a life insurance company. So mm -hmm. I think that got people thinking about, oh, I need to do that. So I think mm -hmm. that's why that's there. Um, so yeah, so we do this every year because it, as a content creator, if I do not exactly know who I'm talking to, you know, what am I doing? What's interesting in, in this is that um, the females are 64%. And they are the majority of your listeners. They're mm. making 102K and the household income is 200K. So presumably they're either married or in a de facto relationship, but it's kind of like 
the the female who's driving the money forward mm. in the household is is that a right inference? Did I get that right? Oh, uh, maybe. I think a couple of things. So, female like sixty four percent. That used to be up over seventy five percent. So it has come down the last few years. Um, I think you know chicks like to listen to podcasts more than guys, maybe. Mm. Okay. Uh, and particularly with this type of stuff, you know, I know because I'm a guy, right, myself. <laughs> so I, I can speak on behalf of some guys here. I Sometimes it's like I don't need to be explained how to do it. I can do this. Right. And maybe women can be like, oh, no, I'm keen to ex- to hear how it works. Or that maybe common, there's a level of humility. like Yeah, you said, or that someone... common story like guys will, you know, buy the new thing try and put it together without reading the instructions. Oh, I don't need yeah. that. I can do this. And then 20 minutes later, I can't do this. And then I'll revert to the instructions. So right, right. I don't know. I know, for example, our YouTube audience, you know, we've only got, I think, just the 5,000 because we don't really hear our YouTube. Right. I know YouTube is a higher weighting to male. And sure. interesting. I don't know if it's a learning style either. Um, for me, I am a visual learner. Like. Yeah. Show me YouTube, show me, draw it, all that stuff. So, yeah, yeah, I think that's a very interesting observation as well. But, yeah, I I just every year we need to talk to our audience. We've got a lot of professional listeners, young professionals, and our podcast isn't for everyone. And like yours isn't for everyone. Um, If you're on a really, really low income and you are looking for heaps of money hacks and money tips and all that stuff, we're probably not the podcast because we don't spend a heap of time optimizing how to save eight dollars on a shop where i know other content creators will where you know my listeners we just want the big rocks how can i maximize the big rocks in my life um yeah i think (laughs) the other thing that was interesting here is the top five money goal share investing is number one and number three is property yeah obviously i'm a property guy so i've come at this with a little bit of bias but why do you think that is is it because they, I mean, they don't have less money. Their household income is 200K plus. So presumably they can, and net worth is 250K. So they can afford probably not just one, but multiple investment properties. But why is, and I was, I don't know if guilty is the right word, but I also fell into this where when you first start working, it's like, oh, okay, I've got some money. I've got some savings in the bank. I've got income. I better get into the stock market. Why is that number one? And and not investment property. Not that one is necessarily better than the other, but why do you think there it's like that in that order? I a couple of things. It's obviously easier to buy shares than it is to buy property. So number one, I can cash flow some shares over the weeks. I can't cash flow property. Like yep. so that's number one. Number two, I reckon. Maybe in the world, there is a perception that if I own shares, shares equals get rich. Yeah. I, I don't know. Um, but that's There's probably a connotation what... for sure. I had it in me as well. Yeah. I mean, and, you know, there is a, an element of, you know, I was talking to someone the other day. They don't want to be an investor in terms of share, uh, in terms of properties, because I just don't want to deal with you know, tenants and maintenance and all that crap. So I would say the number one thing would be sharing investing because the the entry pain point is so low. It's so easy. Technology has improved that with all the micro investing apps and mm. and all that stuff. I mean, like, yeah, and again, like we've got a, a mic or well, a, a platform that sponsored the My Millennial Money podcast at the moment on our Tuesday show, Sharesies. And um, yeah, it's easy to get started. In fact, if you use the promo code MMM, they'll add dollars <laughs> to your account. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I I just don't know. That's sure. the that's the answer. But Perhaps it's way, also because they don't have their own property yet, and they're not aware of rent vesting, or they're you know it's just that whole mm, it's a bigger bigger rock in the jar, so to speak. Yeah. So I yeah I don't know. But the thing I do know is. Each year when that changes, and if that changes, I need to slightly pivot my content. Sure, sure. And one of the things that I always think about 
um, and I struggled with myself is how to think, how to think. So like there's this, I quote the statistic all the time about how in the world, 10% of people think, 20% of people think they think, and then the balance of people, 70%, they rather die than think. Um, mm. Perhaps in your audience, or maybe just asking you directly as a person, um, in your experience, what is your best advice on how people can actually learn to think? So like if I ask you a question like, hey, um, Glenn, my audience has $50,000 in the bank right now. They want to invest it. Obviously, they want to get ahead in life. They want to retire early. You know, typical mm. cliche sort of question. I don't want you to give me the answer because that depends. Mm. Yeah, it's different for different people. But how should people think about that in order to get the answer for themselves? Okay, so if I lean back into my financial planning days, financial planning, it's actually pretty easy. And, and this kind of really helped me. I'm actually not that great at maths. In fact, I hated it. My least favorite subject at school. But a good financial advisor is a great project manager. So what we need to do in order to work out, and we'll use the example, I've saved up $50,000. What do I do? Well, we first need to go back to, well, what are your goals? Like, what do you actually want to do? Like, do you want to buy a house? Do you want to travel? Do you want to not buy a house? Are you happy to rent in capital city and live life? So I think a lot of the first thing to do is go back to what your goals are. And to help people try and think, I really believe it is to get an old fashioned pen and paper, or you might use Google Keep or Evernote or whatever. Do they still have Evernote? I don't know why I said that. Um, it was a good app at the time. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so I just think it is that let's get some data out mm. of our head onto paper. So, well, okay, what does the next 12 months look like for you? Well, I, you know, I want to get out of debt and then maybe do some travel. Okay, travel, debt, oh, maybe start to save for a, a house deposit. Yeah, all right, let's write that down. Yeah. So we can start to get stuff out onto paper. And then what we need to do is basically triage our goals. And for me, I'm the type of person that I'm a one and done, one thing at a time, done, yeah. move on to the next one. Just for that sense of progress rather than stringing out, I've got a bank account for holiday, I've got a bank account for starting my business, I've got a bank account for um, saving for a new house. Like just, ugh, let's just quarantine our separate goals, then triage and then prioritize. Um, so I think that's number one, just to be really clear on your goals and what you want to do. And then I think it's, we go, okay, well, and that's why, and you may have heard it before and I've got it in front of me. Um, so basically the reason I developed this and it's in the book, sort your money out and get invested. Every time I had people come into my financial planning office, I'm like, oh, we want to invest. We want to be an investor. I'm like, sweet. Awesome. What are your lifestyle goals? Oh, we want to save up and put the kids through private school or, oh, I really want to, what's an example here, start a business or we want to start a family or we want to save for a first home. I'm like, okay, so we do have some lifestyle goals. Yeah. Come in, you want to invest, but we do have some lifestyle goals. Okay, sweet. Well, we want to build this sound financial house on the right foundations and that's why I developed foundation one. We've got to have a budget and a spending plan, just <laughs> some type of money system done. Foundation two, we're cashed up and we're debt free. And I mean cashed up by an emergency fund, maybe three months worth of expenses. We've got no consumer debt. Mm -hmm. Foundation three was a protection plan. So we've got our income insurances in place, life insurance if we've got a family, because if you die, you don't want to leave your family without any cash. And then foundation four is the wills and estate plan. Now, of those four foundations, spending plan, cashed up and debt-free, a protection plan and wills and estate planning, once they're all factored in, now we can go, okay, we are building on solid foundations. Right. So then having a good spending plan will say, okay, well, 
we've got that 50 grand that we want to do something with. We go back to base camp where we need $12,000 as a emergency fund. Oh, we've got an $8,000 personal loan there. Mm -hmm. Well, that's got to go. So we've just pretty much got rid of 20 grand of the money that you thought you had. So realistically, we've now got $30,000. So, well, let's go up. What do we want to do? Well, we want to save for our first home or start a business or upgrade the car or travel. Well, there's a discussion there. It's like, okay, we need to deploy that capital into the goals. Or you could be like, look, we've kind of met all our goals. We've got the home happening. Um, we've got our spending plan and the spending plan says, you know, I've got a thousand dollars spare a month left over and the spending plan caters for a bit of holiday savings throughout the year and the kids stuff. So we're pretty set. Mm -hmm. so we've got a thousand dollars a month left over. We've now got 30 grand left because we did pay off that, uh, that car loan and we did fund the emergency fund. Well, then we step into long-term wealth accumulation. And mm -hmm. that is that roof of the house, like the share portfolios, the investment properties and all that stuff. Right. And if you've got a burning desire to buy an investment property, well, we're probably doing that before we start doing shares because we can cash flow shares with that $1,000 a month easy. But if we put that 30 grand into shares straight away, it's going to be a long time before we can save up more to get a deposit for an investment property, right? So I don't know if that really answered your question, but that's kind of the direction that I would go. Mm. With, it all starts about what are your goals and what are your values in life with your money? Mm -hmm. And then just before that, we've got to make sure we're on sound foundations. Well, what I'm hearing is it's very like a very orderly way of approaching that question of how should I invest? How should I get ahead? It's not jumping to the conclusion of what type of investment property, what suburb is booming, or this is the stock pick, or that's just you know, dollar cost average into this ETF. Mm -hmm. It's actually getting your house in order and saying, okay, well, <laughs> let's just hold on, right? Let's mm. see actually how much we have after all our buffers, all our protection, insurances, et cetera. And yeah, I mean, there's too many people who jump into investing in property because they realize two years later that actually the goal was never passive income. It was something else or, or like I, I've, I mean, I'm in property. The number of people who say, look, we've got a hundred thousand dollar share portfolio. That's more than all of our friends, but like that's not going to get us to a retirement in 10 mm. years time. And we actually need to leverage this really hard and shares and isn't going to do it for us. So I really vibe with what you're saying, reverse engineering the goal. Um, and then going from there, I guess the problem is just to play the devil's advocate just for one second. I experienced this myself is like, you know, you don't know what you don't know. Mm. So it's like, what is my goal? Well, I don't know what's possible for me. I don't know what's practical for me. If I'm sitting here as a 33-year-old, my goal may be um, to, you know, like sometimes I have people say this, oh, I want a million-dollar passive income. It's like, mm, I don't know about that, you know, like that might be a little bit too audacious or they may undercut it. Um, how do you, like without people like you on their corner, on their side, how do you even know what's possible? Because there'll be, People saying, oh, yeah, 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 do this course and, you know, well, you'll get X or do this and you'll get Y. How do you even get a balanced view of what's possible for you? Yeah, so we do, uh, well, we started to record these focus sessions with me, right? And people will call in, we'll spend an hour talking about them to give them focus and clarity. I recorded an episode the other day. This guy had a million dollars saved, invested in equities, right? And he just started by saying, um, well, I just want to get to a million dollars. So he just, all he did was save, 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 work, 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 work. He kind of regretted all the hustle that he put into it, but he got to his goal. Now I would probably say if you're out there and wondering if you are a bit goalless or whatever, right? Why don't you just step back and just put some boundary markers in your life to prevent any whoopsies happening. Now, I've always said, if you're out of consumer debt, right? And a lot of the time people go, oh, I've got five grand credit card. It's not because they bought one $5,000 lounge or one $5,000 fridge, you know, or one transaction. It's death by a thousand cuts, overspending, sloppy money habits, 
and the wash up is you've spent more than what you've earned. So that's a, yeah. often the cause of consumer debt. We've spent more than we've earned. So if you, for example, you didn't know what you wanted to do, right? Here's the thing. What if you worked out in your budget? And for me, my financial plan, my own personal financial plan, it's three things. When I get paid, I give some, I save some, and I spend some in that order. So first, I'm generous. I've got giving and generosity happening. Second, I'm saving some. Now, that is all my properties, they're on principal and interest because I'm a spender and I just want to make sure I don't overspend. I've got superannuation sorted. I've got an investment bond. I've got an investment account in my trust. I give some, I save some, then I spend some. So if I blow my weekly wage after I've given and I've saved, I'm not doing any detriment to my life. So someone who is like, I don't know what I'm doing financially with my life. I don't really have goals. What you could do is you could do a things like, okay, first thing is I'm going to save an emergency fund of three months worth of expenses. And we'll just call it 15 grand, 12 grand, 10 grand, whatever you want it to be. Yeah. Secondly, what if you said, I'm just now going to save an amount, whether it's 10% of everything I earn into a separate online savings account. I am not touching it for holidays for anything other than future me. Now, future me could be a property, future me could be shares, future me could be education and a course. So I've just set that framework up that every time I get paid, I'm in investing or putting 10% into a separate account, right? Now, at least you can just go on and live your life without any goals or whatever, and you're still looking after yourself financially. It's still okay. Because when that lightning bolt comes, you're sitting on a beach in Bali or you're going on a bushwalk down the road and you're like, hmm, I actually do want to buy a house. You're going to have some cash there to pull the trigger and you haven't spent that money on frivolous things and then you can go, okay, I think I'm going to do that. And then what we do, we really start to focus and this is even without having a budget or a spending plan. This is just you can be sloppy AF, but at least you've protected yourself and you've had some type of savings. And what you could do, you're like, all right, well, I'm putting $1,000 a fortnight into this account. That $1,000 a fortnight now, that's for home deposit. That's right. for investment property. Now, I would go one step further. If you really wanted to be wild and YOLO and don't have any goals, but I don't want to spend all my money, what if you told your employer, depending on your salary and all that stuff, because um, you don't want to go over the limit, I'm just going to salary sacrifice five or 10% more of my income into super. Then yeah. spend every living cent you've got. You're still saving 20% of your earnings, like your super guarantee and the extra. And then once you snap out of it and get your goals and your eat, pray, love sorted, then you can swing around and go, okay, I'll stop paying that money into super uh, because I know it's a goal now. So yeah. they're just a couple of things. If you ring fence some big things in your life to protect you and not waste money and just keep living and not mm -hmm. going into any other debt. And likewise, if you are listening to this and you're 22, you went to uni a little bit later, I honestly think if you leave university and you've got $2,000 saved or $2 saved, as long as you graduate with $0 or $1 in the bank account, that is so much better than graduating with consumer debt or any debt other than hex or help debt. Yeah. Because we, we just want to be able to, and the reason why debt, it's such a big deal and you've just got to keep away from it is because you are, you are spending your tomorrow's prosperity today. And if you have consumer debt, so we use that example. I'm, I don't know what I'm doing at the moment. Uh, I'm just living. You know, you don't have that 10% to super and building for the future. You don't have that 10% to a, a separate bank account that's out of your life. I'm just living. I've got a credit card. We don't want it to be when you get your act together, when you have that eat, pray, love moment that, oh, I want to do this. We don't want that to go be like, but damn it, I've got to pay this bloody debt off first. Yeah. So I get thus, it. thus concludes my Sermon on the Mount. <laughs> no, I love it. I, I, as you were talking, I was like, 
how do I encapsulate that strategy in one word? And for me, like the word that came up was like launch pad. Even mm -hmm. if you don't know where you're launching to, at least create a launch pad, like a catapult kind of system. <clears throat> so that when you are sure and you, I love these like subtle references that you drop, by the way, you, you have your eat, pray, love moment. You're like, okay, let me go to my launch pad. Everything else is sorted. You know, mm -hmm. I've got everything and I can just fly to the moon. I, I, I love that. Um, yeah, I, I absolutely, and I, I don't, I can't relate to it maybe because of my background or upbringing or anything like that, but I can't relate to free spending, like mindless mm. spending. I know like most people do it. Yeah. Welcome but... to my world, boy. <laughs> yeah. It's like maybe because you know, we were so frugal, like growing up, we didn't have much. So I was like, you know, every, I remember like asking my dad for like a yo-yo when I was little. Like, yeah, and, yeah. Like a... and he was like, no, that's like, that's like $5. I'm like, okay, fine. <laughs> you mm. know, so, um, and maybe that's for another episode, but yeah, just just kind of rein those things in. And by hearing again and again from folks like yourself and just concepts like this, I think it inspires or at least regulates people to create that launch pad and not just go berserk with their finances. I'll, I'll use an analogy, and it is that, you know, I did scouts and cubs and all that when I was younger. For me, it's always been that be prepared vibe in my life. Yesterday, I actually did something that I've always wanted to do. And it is a bit of a financial luxury and it is a bit dumb and stupid, but when the time comes, if I need it, it's there. And I'll, I'll use the example. So what I've purchased, so I've, I've got a UPS, right? That I connect all this stuff to. So if there's a blackout, okay, sweet, save what I'm working on, orderly shutdown of the computer and all that. So that's really important if I'm recording and there's a blackout, right? Yeah. So my house that I'm renting at the moment, because I'm a rent vester, I'm very sophisticated. Thank you. Nice. <laughs> um, I, I'm fortunate enough to have a solar panel on the roof, right? And there's a battery in the house. Mm. Now, when there was a blackout the other day, um, the house is wired. So blackout, it was at night, all the lights went out, there was a storm, the fridge turned on and the light circuit worked. So off the battery, right? But I've always wanted to buy like a generator or a big battery pack. And so yesterday I ordered a, a portable battery pack that I can have at home. So if the power goes out or go camping or whatever, I've got this portable power pack. Now it's $3,000, $3,200 oh, it was. And the, the thing is like almost a fire extinguisher, when you need it at the time, if you don't have it, it's too late. Yeah. So the house is burning down. Oh, crap. No fire extinguisher. But I got the fire extinguisher. House is burning down. Yep. There it is done. Kind of like that stuff by not having consumer debt and by having some cash savings on the sideline, when that moment comes, eat, pray, love, you've, you've got that launch pad sorted. You can't build your launch pad in a week or two weeks yeah. because when the time comes, it's too late to start building. You've missed the opportunity. And, and this could lead into having, like I've got, um, I'm always cash heavy, um, which I've got an account, which is kind of like an opportunity fund. Like if someone's like, oh, hey, you want to do this? I'm like, yep, sweet. I've got money for an opportunity fund. Okay. But like that power thing, you know, if there's a blackout and I want to watch TV for a couple of hours and connect it to the, I mean, in the, olden days you just read when there's a blackout but whatever <laughs> if i still want to connect the nbn router and the tv i know yeah. i'll be able to watch for eight hours straight right so <laughs> but that's a luxury but it's the same analogy the fire extinguisher the emergency battery pack or the launch pad hmm. you need that stuff set up so when the time comes that you need it, it could be you got fired from your job oh crap all right i did want to start my own business now i can do a launch pad in this or um that moment ah oh, Yes, I want to buy a house to live in. You can actually get the ball rolling right now and you don't have to spend three, five, ten months friggin' paying off debt and saving cash. Yeah, just as you were saying, like my equivalent to that battery pack is having 
an up and go and a bag of chips in the spare tire area in the boot of the car. Cause if my son who's four like cacks it and we're yeah. like broken down somewhere, at least there's like an emergency <laughs> <It's> <laughs> survival pack. Yeah. <laughs> survival pack. I'll go hungry as long as he doesn't cry. I can't deal and with that. <laughs> I, I think my, and I've got to really watch myself because like my personality is a little bit, um, what do they call them? Like the tin hatters or the end time people? Like what are they with the preppers? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm probably the same actually. Yeah, my personality could go there and, but I'm stopping <laughs> at the battery pack. <laughs> but, so you're going to have like a anti-alien sort of something on your roof and oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but as well, I've, I've also, I've bought the battery pack just, you know, if I am recording a podcast at home with a guest, I'm going to be running my recorder off the battery pack um, yeah, right, right. just right. in case, but, but anyway, yeah. analogies yeah. for days, right? That that's really useful. And I'm just conscious of time. I want to honor your time as well. And you do have this um the book that I think everyone well, that's that was going to be my question. So you you're mm. an author of Sort Your Money Out. You know, you've got the book also Sort Your Career Out. Mm. Um last question, I promise. From all the episodes that you've done on my millennial money and your experience writing multiple books, um what is like the best advice? I know this is cliche and it's mm. hard to boil down, et cetera, et cetera. But like, what's like the best advice that you could give someone watching this right now who's perhaps, let's say, 29 years old, yeah. um, has a 100K income? You know, what, what's your best advice? And maybe this is a teaser for them to actually get your book. Well, the book here, Sort Your Money Out and Make More Money, I wrote that, uh, came out the start of this year, right? The book before that, Sort Your Money Out, as you said. Now, this book, Sort Your Career Out, I marketed this as the prequel to this. Right. Because my advice is the best investment that you can ever make is in you and your career and your ability to generate income. You are an annuity. You are a walking annuity. Every year... You go to work, you come home, and money gets given to you. That's what an annuity is. An annuity is something that you put capital into, and every year it spits out X amount for as long as you live. So understanding, don't worry about bloody investing in shares. Don't worry about building a property portfolio. Don't worry about starting a business. Worry about the person in the mirror and worry about making sure that you can get the best return from your time that's put into the marketplace every week. And you think like, imagine if you upskill, did a, a study course or, you know, something, a certification that might cost four or $5,000. I was talking to someone the other day, they were going to do a course that cost $8,000, but it's a guaranteed, if they can get that $8,000 course, it's a guaranteed $20,000 a year pay increase. So you tell me a better investment than $8,000 that spits out an extra 20 grand a year. Sure, sure. Yeah, I'll wait. You know what I mean? So I honestly think anyone listening, particularly if you're young in your career, you know, sure, you know, get a little micro investing app and throw $10, $20 a week into that to be in got in involved and engaged into investing. Sure save up, buy an investment property, knock yourself out, buy a house. You need to buy a house if you want long-term, you know, rent stability if possible and all that stuff. I mean, you know, situation dependent, but you've just got to make sure that your career is set and your job is not your career. Your job is not your career. And actually one thing I forgot, we talked about it earlier. And if I can finish on this, when you talked about um, people worrying about, you know, do I buy the, you know, we talked about the sound financial house, right? And do mm -hmm. I buy the shares? Do I do the super? Do I buy the house? You know, the biggest problem that people have when it comes to their money and investing decisions you can say no because you don't know where I'm going with this. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was rhetorical, but you carry on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, the problem is people focus on the tactics, not on the strategy. Sure. So buying a townhouse versus freehold, that's tactical play. Yeah. Shares in super or outside of super, 
kind of tactical, probably not a heaps good example because it could be a bit strategic, but, you know, do I buy VDHG or IVV and yeah, VAS yeah. and do it myself? Which product? Yeah. Product, it's tactics. And financial advisor is more about let's nail the strategy. Yeah. And when you get to the pinpoint of the strategy, the product will present itself. Sure. <laughs> it really will. Like my strategy, it, a wild example is the strategy is to build three properties in our own name because we love property and all that. But part of that strategy is we can't have all our eggs in one basket. So we're going to keep superannuation for equities and diversification mm -hmm. and not buy three properties out of super and two with a self-managed super fund. Mm -hmm. That's a strategy. So everyone always gets caught up with the tactics and you can't lead your life based on tactics. It's, you've got to be strategy first. Yeah, that's such good advice. It's almost like if you're always chasing the next shiny object or you're chasing the tactics, you're like a rag doll. You just be pulled in 10 different directions based on the content that you'll consume and you'll yeah. never really be content because you don't have a North Star. Or if you don't have a North Star, you don't have a catapult to get there in the first place. So yeah, that, that that's really, uh, I like what you said before as well around like you are like almost like a financial product. You are an annuity and I always think like at least from a real estate perspective the best real estate to invest in is actually like between your two years there's, there's probably totally. a, a stock investing way to say that as well but mm. um yeah i'm just i can't echo that and amplify that enough so very very well said but um i just yeah probably wrap it up there and i just want to honor your time and thank you as well um glenn because yeah i mean it's kind of a unique i think career that you've had uh, going mm. from being a tradie for a while, apprentice, and then, you know, financial advisor and, and advising people who are much more richer than you, but maybe not, not on a relative basis. Yeah. And um, and then going into the um, the podcast, I think as a podcaster, you actually learn more from your audience and what mm. they give you. That's kind of what I've experienced, and I'm sure that's what you've experienced, and it's been great to kind of get that knowledge um, for my audience from from you as well. So very grateful. Thanks, PK, and thanks for everyone listening. And if you do listen to my podcast, thanks for listening. I'll get back to work. <laughs> thanks, guys. Do check out um, the books that Glenn mentioned and also his podcast, My Millennial Money. Highly recommend it. Thank you again. Subscribe. See you next time. Thanks, man.